Are some people fated to be unhappy? That's going to be the thing I'm talking to you about today. Shakespeare wrote about something like this, um, about Romeo and Juliet. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. You know, for a long time, people thought that it was the stars that determined the fates of human beings, that the positions of uh, the constellations at the moment of your birth would determine what was going to happen in your life. And even though we may not believe in uh, that Gemini has much to do with our fate, we do think now that genes play a huge role in how people uh, end up and, and where people go. And uh, this is something that, uh, that science has shown. So if you happen to have an um, identical twin who has major depressive disorder, you're, uh, at a 40, you're, you've got a 46% chance of having it yourself. Even though we don't think Taurus has much influence over us these days, we do think trauma does. And we talk about how if you've had adverse childhood experiences, that you're more likely to have depression when you're older. If you've had four major adverse childhood uh, events in your life, you're at a 4.6-fold increase for having major depression when you're, when you're older. And these things affect your brain. So we've, we've heard stories of how the brain is changed by genes, by uh, early experiences in life. And so this is a study that I was involved with um, where we, we collated, we compiled the, the results of, of hundreds of studies um, on over uh, 10,000 people who had mental illness. And we, we, we tried to look at what happens when you ask somebody with depression or schizophrenia to, to, try, to, uh, to try to remember something or try to, to reorganize information, to perform executive function tasks. And we found that there were some common problems across mental illnesses, that the brains were actually changed in, in uh, where the blood flow moved, when they, where the blood flowed when they tried to do these tasks. And we were able to, to see that across mental illnesses, there are common regions that are, are disordered. Um, and so it seems that... Um, that that's a, a, a major problem. Now, when you have these changes in brain, it also seems to, uh, people who have these changes start to experience feelings of uh, thoughts that come into their head. Th thoughts like, I'm worthless. I'm a burden. I'm alone. Things are hopeless. I have no choice. I cannot change. And the tragedy is these things feel just determined that it's a chain of causality from genes and difficult experiences in life leading to brain changes, leading to negative thoughts, leading to things like depression or anxiety. But is it a chain? Is it really determined or fated by these different uh, influences that, that that's how you'll end up, that's where you're going? And I think that there's, there's been some exciting new research in this area around what's actually happening uh, in, in the brain. So just as by way of review, we're going to go back and, and talk about something called neuroplasticity. Now, this is a, a, uh, something that was mind-blowing before, but is important to review. So, okay, so a long time ago, for, for, uh, for almost a century, neuroscience was of the opinion that the brain, once it got to a certain level, once you got to a certain age, was more or less stable. Even though you got new face cells, um, your, the skin cells in your face uh, turned over relatively quickly. So about every month you get a brand new face. About every seven years you get a brand new skeleton. But neurons, they didn't change. Neurons were, the, the neurons you have now are the neurons you had then, and it's a stable thing over years and years. And this was, this was uh, part of the information that led to this idea that the brain really doesn't change as much as uh, we might think. Um, and, uh, and so this was, this was overturned um, not that many years ago by studying monkeys. So what they would do is people would, would uh, so scientists would teach monkeys particularly challenging motor tasks. And as they um, moved their fingers in these specific ways, parts of the brain specifically associated with uh, moving of the fingers, so the motor cortex, the part that was, in, uh, that was responsible for the fingers and thumb, those parts physically got bigger 
And this was mind-blowing. It wasn't just that you got better with the same brain. Your brain physically experienced changes. And this was neuroplasticity. Now, the, the astonishing thing, and the thing that is important for us to remember, was that it wasn't just any kind of stimu uh, stimulus that caused the, um, the animals in these experiments to change. It was when they were able to direct their attention. Um, and there's other research that shows this as well. So your attention is like a spotlight. You shine that spotlight on certain parts of the brain, and that's the part of the brain that's going to, um, that's going to grow or change. So um, if you... Uh, everybody who's here and if you're watching online, I want you to raise your hand. So just put your hand up and go like this. You just used your abductor digiti minimi. This tiny little muscle whose, whose entire purpose in life is to do this. That's it. That's its entire job. Now, you probably don't go to the gym to exercise this, but if you did, and if you exercise the adductor, uh, abductor digiti minimi for 15 minutes a day for 12 weeks, as they did in this experiment, you would get about 50% stronger, so pretty, pretty good, pretty solid gains. Now, <laughs> now, if I told you to, okay, now go home and think about moving your abductor digiti minimi for 15 minutes a day for 12 weeks, you would get 30% stronger. You get physically increased strength by thinking about moving a muscle. That's astonishing. That's astonishing, okay? <laughs> so, so when you think about like, okay, what's, what, what, is, what does this mean? This is like mind blowing. Okay, and this is physical strength. But, but what, if it, what if this applied to more than just physical strength? What if when you shined that light on other parts, you could change it? It's almost like you are able to sculpt your brain as a uh, sculptor or as, a, um, as an artist is able to create sculptures, as a sculptor is able to change the clay to create something beautiful, you're able to do that with your own brain. It, it's almost like, imagine being entrusted to program an android that a tech billionaire decides we've got this android and we want you to take it home and teach it everything there is to know. We want you to train it to be the best possible android that you possibly can. That's happened. You have one. It's called you. You are able to program your own self in ways that are rather profound. And so here's, I want to review for the rest of this talk, some key areas, key ways you can do that. So several levers for changing your brain, for reprogramming yourself in ways that you'd like. All right. Lever number one, pay attention to create habits. Okay, what do I mean by this? I mean that everybody is always having to choose where to put their attention. And so for a lot of people, there's thoughts running through their head all the time. Um, whether you're depressed or whether you have a, uh, just happen to get a bad grade on a test that you weren't expecting or whatever it is, you might have the thought, oh, I'm worthless. I, I just, I am not good at this. Or you also might have the thought, I matter to some people. So imagine putting your attention, that spotlight, shining it on the thought, I'm worthless. That grows up into a mood, into an emotion, into an experience of sadness. But if you do the same thing in the other direction, I matter to some people, that grows up into a mood of happiness or joy. And so, but the trouble is that there's a lot of things to pay attention to. So as far as I can tell, I can't see everybody here, but as far as I can tell, every one of you is breathing. <laughs> but at the same time, you're listening to me, some of you, and also, some of you might be worried about that, that math test next period. Um, but also, you may, have, uh, be, you, may, you may be wondering, what, what happened to that girl I texted, and, and why isn't she texting back? <laughs> and all of these things are going through your head. You have a very limited spotlight, but sadly, all of these things that are competing for your attention, and so what is a person to do? Well, brush your teeth. Now, okay, I assume most of you brushed your teeth today, but how did you do it? You sort of stumbled out of bed half-conscious and were able to successfully clean all of the things off of your teeth over the night without really having to put much attention into it. Why? Well, you've developed this habit of toothbrushing, that your, your hand knows exactly what to do without you having to even think about it, and you're able to worry about the math test or think about what's going to be happening or, or be excited about uh, the, the, spe the speeches you're going to hear today. All of that happened without you thinking about it because you've developed a habit. Now, as I said, there are motor habits, but there's also uh, habits of mind, habits of, uh, of mood, habits of, of thought that we can change too. 
And that's how you can, uh, you can move forward. Um, habits are tools for helping us get what we want. They are crystallizations of our repeated choices. We all have a nature. We all have a, a way that we're born. But have you ever done something so much that it just became just automatic? That's sometimes called second nature. You're able to develop habits that are, that are natural, that make things go easily and smoothly. Um, and this is from, uh, from Buddha. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. And so where you put your attention, where you direct your thoughts, is critically important for who you become, for what shape that takes, that, uh, that, that lump of clay that is your brain takes as you grow. All right. Lever number two. Examine your feelings. So imagine being put into a, a scanner, an MRI, and shown this face. Now, what happens when you're shown this face and asked to decide, is this person more likely named Samuel or more likely named Helen, is something very, uh, that, would, that had been well established for a long time. There's a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is a, a deep part of the brain, um, a very emotional part that processes emotions and fear. That lights up. It gets uh, super active when you uh, ha show somebody in an emotional face. Then, in other times, you show them the same face, but then you ask them, is that face angry or scared? This time, the amygdala calms down. Now, the astonishing thing about this is that the stimulus was identical. It's the exact same face, but you're asking people to do two different things. And, and, and this is also mind-blowing. You think that, oh, it's, and people sometimes uh, it's, use the term, uh, oh, I, I've been triggered. And it's like, okay, yes, from one sense, you go from, you go from very quickly going from one thing to another, and it's very rapid. And that's true, and that's a true part of that metaphor. But the part that's not true is that there's a choice involved. How are you going to process that information? There's a multitude of ways that you could choose to process that information. In this particular study, simply putting a label on the emotion that you're feeling reduces the experience of that emotion. And that is incredibly powerful. That is something that you can use when you experience stress or worry. What is, just, just think, what is the name of this thing that I'm experiencing? That's different than the experience of it itself. All right, lever number three. Don't believe everything you think. Now, what do I mean by this? Okay, so this is, this is one of my favorite studies in the last few decades. Um, okay, so imagine Jennifer. Jennifer works in a uh, uh, medical school cadaver lab, uh, which means cadavers are people who've donated their body to science. And so um, this is a story that I, uh, that was, uh, so, so the question is, it, listen to the story and tell me, has, has Jennifer done anything wrong? Okay, so she works in this lab. Um, she's a vegetarian for moral reasons. Um, and, uh, but one day, she sees a, one of these bodies uh, who had you know, trained medical students. Medical students had done the dissection. It was all done. It was going to be incinerated. Um, she decides she's going to uh, cut a piece off of the cadaver, take it home, cook it, and eat it. <laughs> Has she done anything wrong? Now, a vast majority, a majority of people, when hearing this, say, yes! She ate a person. You can't eat people. But the person who did the research tried to challenge them and said, well, okay, why did she do anything wrong? And there was a number, a very high number of people that couldn't explain on their own moral rationale why she had done anything wrong. And he calls this moral dumbfounding. That like, what he, what he suggests is that a lot of times the emotion comes first and then the reason is a post hoc justification to justify why I was feeling that way. And so this is something that's astonishing because when you think about this, when you think about these thoughts, sometimes the emotion is the thing that causes the thoughts. I feel sad, and so all of a sudden, why do I feel sad? Well, maybe, it's the, maybe a justified reason for feeling sad is being actually worthless, or really a burden, or actually alone. Um, these are things that might, be, um, the, that might be that the emotion is sometimes causing the thoughts, but then, but then the thoughts might also cause the emotion, leading to a cycle of misery and despair that is hard to break out of. 
And this is sometimes called depression. And so here we return to this picture of genes and uh, nature and nurture and difficult experiences leading to changes in the brain, leading to neg uh, negative thoughts, leading to sadness, despair, depression. But how do you break out? This is, uh, this is David Burns. He's one of the leading thinkers in psychotherapy and how to help people break out of cycles like this. And he says this, you can learn to change the way you think about things. You can also change your basic values and beliefs. And when you do, you'll often experience profound and lasting changes in your mood, outlook, and productivity. So there's a different pathway. So certainly, these things sometimes cause changes in the brain which cause negative thoughts which lead to negative feelings. But, but, and here's the critical thing, there are other thoughts. There's other thoughts, and it's not a mechanism that goes directly from those difficult things to negative thoughts to despair. You can choose other thoughts, other stories, other stories, especially positive stories, especially positive stories that are true, that you can think about, that you can direct your attention to. And if you do that, uh, you have a different outcome. There is an option. And the reason why this matters so much to me um, is that people often feel stuck in their negative thoughts. They feel like they can't get out. They feel like they can't change. But it's not true. And when people are in extreme states of sadness or despair, sometimes, and this is a, uh, a picture of... Um, Hamlet, or a sculpture around Hamlet, another Shakespeare character who also contemplated this idea of, you know, is life really worth living? Should I, should I end my life? And as a psychiatrist, I, I see patients often that are wrestling with this question, and it's a terribly difficult question um, for these patients because they feel like there is no hope. They feel like it is all despair, and things will never get better, and they cannot change. And what I want to say is, that's not true. It's not true that there is no hope. It's not true that things will always be this way. That moods can dramatically change. Feelings can be dramatically altered. And that, to a large extent, where you put your attention, where you direct your thoughts, even when it's extremely difficult in some of these states, can have profound impacts in, your, uh, in where you end up, and where your thoughts end up, and where your mood ends up. And you can break out of these cycles that may not have been your fault. That certainly your genes are not your fault and, and the difficult experiences are not your fault. But, but you have the option. You can break out of some of these cycles by changing where you put your attention. And that, that is hope. And that is mind-blowing. And so, the conclusion of the matter. If you change your mind, you will change your mood. Thank you very much.